Well, welcome to the last part in the review aspect of the cerebral spinal fluid flow. Now, this part is actually meant to just be a kind of capstone of what you just saw. You saw a flow in terms of a flow chart as well as kind of these diagrams that kind of had these animations that were removing the fluid from one aspect to the next, right? Because we know that CSF flows in a one-way flow. It starts in blood and it moves through the entire CNS and then ends in blood in the internal jugular vein. Now, we could read those things and we could kind of memorize these diagrams, but this helps us to really solidify them and retain them in our brain. The more aspects you do, the different modalities in which you actually can obtain the information, the more you're going to remember it in the long run. And so in the same way, we're going to do this review exercise, and I'm going to ask you to participate. And so I'm not going to just kind of show you, you know, aerobics is not the way to go. If you just watch aerobics, you don't gain anything. You actually gain it by doing it. And so in the same way, I'm going to ask you to do some what we call kinesthetic exercises. And we'll do these right now. And so please make sure that you have these pictures in mind. Otherwise, we're going to be doing these arbitrary kind of movements. But this is kind of like a kata or kind of a dance or a, a kind of a tai chi kind of movements in which we are able to then memorize the flow of CSF and their structures. All right? And so let's begin at the beginning. Remember we talked about that CSF starts at blood. And so we need a blood network, blood vessel network to start with. And that's what we call choroid plexus. And remember choroid plexus, right? It's a modified capillary bed. So what we do is, uh, I like to represent that as like these little itty bitty tiny little maze-like convoluted structures. And so uh, always start in anatomical position, right? And then we go right into these tiny little things. You can go and you say the word choroid plexus. Say it with me, choroid plexus. All right, well, good. You got step one down. Well, where does the CSF flow as it bleeds out of this choroid plexus? Well, it fills up these two what we call lateral ventricles. And these two lateral ventricles, as you saw in the pictures, are large C-shaped, bilateral, so they go choroid plexus, and you can represent these with your arms as well. Start here, because they start kind of anteriorly, and then they whip around all the way to the front, okay? So they make these large C-shaped structures. And you can say these words with me. If you do this, actually, you say the word lateral ventricle, and we just, you're done, right? Lateral ventricle. Now let's add these together so we know the flow. So it goes choroid plexus to the lateral ventricles, all right? And then after that, the lateral ventricles end, and they pour the products through two holes. That's why you put your hands in holes like this. And so after you go into the lateral ventricles like this, you end, and you pour them out into what we call interventricular foramen. Say that with me, interventricular foramen, all right? So we got choroid plexus, and adding these all together, choroid plexus to the lateral ventricles to the inter ventricular foramen, okay? Well, where do the interventricular foramen lead? Well, they pour themselves into a very narrow next ventricle called the third ventricle. And we can represent that by just putting our hands kind of tight like this close together. And we can say third ventricle. And you're like, what? where's the second? Well, lateral ventricles, remember, there's two of them. First, second, third. And so we got this third ventricle, and it's right nestled in between the diencephalons, okay? So... The two interventricular foramen lead the fluid into the third ventricle. All right, let's string these together. Choroid plexus to the lateral ventricles through the interventricular foramen into the third ventricle. Well, great. So, so far, we're already there. All right, well, we keep moving. Well, where does it go from the third ventricle? Well, it goes down this long tube, and that's, we can represent that if we're smashed in between the third ventricle. Well, we could go down like this, like a hole down the cerebral aqueduct, all right? And so that's what we will do. So we go from choroid plexus, string these together, to the lateral ventricles, through the interventricular foramen, to the third ventricle, down the cerebral aqueduct, and then we fill the last ventricle, which we call the fourth ventricle, okay? So this is the fourth ventricle. It's a diamond-shaped fourth ventricle right interior to the cerebellum. And so we add that onto our mix. Add it, alright? Choroid plexus to the lateral ventricles through the interventricular foramen to the third ventricle down the cerebral aqueduct into the fourth ventricle. Well, where do we go from here? Well, we have four holes, and I'm glad that I have four appendages. We could represent all of them here. And so, what we're going to do is we're going to go two lateral, well, that's what they're called, two lateral apertures, one median, and it goes posterior. So, since we're in anatomic position, I'm going to use my leg and throw it out. Median aperture. And then I'm standing on one exit as well, 
what you call the central canal that pierces the spinal cord all the way straight down. And so, if you're in the fourth ventricle, the fourth ventricle then leads out through the two lateral apertures, one median apertures, and the central canal. Okay? So we kind of make this kind of balancing act. Hopefully it benefits you too. Don't injure yourself. But it just kind of helps you to burn some calories, build some balance, as well as learn anatomy, right? So after that, we, where do we go? We have these holes that lead outside of the brain. Well, we go into this large space that surrounds the brain and the spinal cord and then fills the function of CSF to help as a cushion. And so we call that area called the subarachnoid space, all right? So watch what we're doing. Subarachnoid space, we're going to represent that by going all around our brain and spinal cord. I don't know how well you can kind of do one of these things, but that's how the cerebral spinal fluid goes. Flows all around the brain and the spinal cord. And so let's start from the beginning. Let's see how well you got it, all right? So where do we start off, right? Choroid plexus to the lateral ventricles, through the interventricular foramen, to the third ventricle, down the cerebral aqueduct, to the fourth ventricle, out through the two lateral and median apertures and the central canal, and then flows into the subarachnoid space. Well, great. Well, we're perfect. We're surrounding the brain and we're doing our functionality, but wait, wait, wait. We're always producing CSF. We're always producing the cerebral spinal fluid, so we've got to get it drained into some place. But we're stuck in the subarachnoid space, underneath the dura. Now, in order to get into our vein structures, we've got to get in between the dura or actually through the dura. So who's to help us? Well, what happens is afterwards, you saw these structures and those diagrams, and all of a sudden the fluid will flow up into areas what we call the arachnoid granulations that pierce the dura and allow the CSF to flow into these modified veins, what we call dural venous sinuses. And so what we find is, after our dance, right, subarachnoid space, where do we go from there? Well, all the arachnoid granulations or villi are located just at the top of the head. And so we're going to represent that with our fingers. We have many of them. We're going to pierce the dura with our fingers and say, arachnoid granulations or arachnoid villi. They're synonymous there. And so let's add that into the mix, right? Chori plexus to the lateral ventricles through the interventricular foramen to the third ventricle, down the cerebral aqueduct to the fourth ventricle, out through the two lateral and one median aperture and the central canal into the subarachnoid space, and then through the arachnoid granulations. Now, these arachnoid granulations pour themselves into those modified veins that we just talked about. And there's three of them that are specific for the flow. Well, I'd be grand, there's a little bit more like the straight signs and stuff like that. But if you're taking a look at the general flow, you'll find these three additional sinuses. And the first one is one that is at the top of the skull, traveling from the anterior side all the way to the posterior side, what we call the superior sagittal sinus. So we're going to represent that by going all the way forward, and then whipping posterior, because that's the way it flows, okay? So this is what we call, after you do the arachnoid granulations, you're going to then step forward and go to the superior sagittal sinus, because it goes from the anterior all the way to the posterior side, traveling along this mid-sagittal plane, okay? So, let's add that, right? Arachnoid granulation to the superior sagittal sinus. Well, great. Well, where does it go from the superior sagittal sinus? Well, it branches into two bilateral sinuses called the transverse sinuses. And they whip around. They start from the posterior side of the occipital bone. And then they whip anterior. And so this is what we're going to do. After we did the superior sagittal sinus, we're going to then whip around called the transverse sinus. And say that with me, right? Superior sagittal sinus to the transverse sinus, because we're traveling transverse. And we're almost done. Okay? The last bit is what we call the sigmoid sinus. And sigmoid by its name means S shape or a curve. And so it's pretty simple to do. Once we're over here at the transverse, we just say sigmoid sinus and make it S. And then we're done. Because what ends is in our blood supply, the hole for the internal jugular vein.